Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Our first story we'll be reading today. My Karen sister demands I adopt her kids. After that, my husband stole $6,000 from my account to spend on golf clubs. And after that, I do not need you staying here with me answering phone calls or processing customers for the rest of the shift. Now for every thumbs up this video gets, one Karen gets fired. Does that mean I won't have to listen to you read all day? So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. My Karen sister demands I adopt her kids. My sister, 31 female, was recently diagnosed with brainstem glioma. Apparently it's big and untreatable due to the location. I'm not sure how long she has, but most likely it will shorten her lifespan by a significant amount. Apparently, she's already experiencing some bad symptoms. My sister has three kids, a newborn and a two-year-old and a six-year-old. She asked me to take them once she passes on. No, we don't have family, and her ex-husband wants nothing to do with the kids since she had cheated on him for years with many men and they aren't his. She doesn't know who the dad is. Personally, I, 25 female, am child-free. My husband, 25 male, is child-free as well. I told her no for the following reasons. 1. Since we are both child-free, it would be unfair to ask my husband to make this kind of sacrifice. We both agreed to no kids when we got married. To change something like that generally means a divorce. 2. I am atheist. My sister wants me to raise them religious and to know God and take them to church. No. 3. I live in a different country where English is not the primary language. I can't teach a 6-year-old a new language when they don't know English well. 4. Six-year age gap means we didn't really grow up together, and the memories I do have, she was always awful to me, like cynical. And after she moved out at 18, we haven't talked once besides at my parents' funeral. I don't even know her kids, let alone her. She cried and called me awful, but it's my life, and ultimately, I get to be selfish with it. A kid isn't an 18-year commitment, it's lifelong, and one I have decided not to take. She cheated with multiple different men and lost her husband. I don't think it's my job to swoop in and save her from consequences of her own actions. I don't feel like I owe her anything. Other people disagree. Friends of hers, whom I've never met, have been reaching out to me and calling me at all hours to leave nasty voicemails, saying I need to step up as a sister, but I just feel like she's trying to use me as her ticket out to passing and not feeling guilty. I'm going to edit so I don't have to continue to say this. I have offered to pay for DNA kits and anything else she needs to help find the fathers of these kids. She doesn't want to. Last edit. I will not be taking in the kids. It's not because I want to teach my sister a lesson or because they are less than for being a product of an affair. I brought it up because I know everyone would ask, where's the father? It's because my sister is a stranger. I haven't talked to her in over 10 years. I've never met her or her kids and I don't want kids. My husband, yes, we talked, would leave. Realistically, it wouldn't work out. With his income, I wouldn't be able to afford the kids anyways. I'm child free, not just because I'm selfish, like so many of you suggest, but because I have mental health issues that would prevent me from ever being a good parent. I have OCD. Not like I keep my house clean OCD, but where I need to shut a door several times until it's completely shut, or noises like dripping water drives me insane. Imagine having a newborn when sounds can drive you mentally insane. It's debilitating. My sister didn't deserve to pass on, and her kids don't deserve their fate. But realistically, their unbiological father is the one who needs to step up, not me. To those of you who said I'm the jerk, but then let me ask you, why aren't you adopting? Why aren't you fostering? Why aren't you making sure you get kids out of the system? Get off your high horse. Not the jerk. I feel bad for your sister, but now is the time to buy some Ancestry DNA kits in order to search for those kids' fathers. And for the people messaging OP to step up and take the kids in if they really cared. It seems like her friends should be better candidates than an estranged sister who has no relationship with the kids. But then again, their friends would rather be flying monkeys than to step up. So, your sister is religious, but cheated on her husband and has three different baby daddies? How does that work? Not the jerk. You aren't obligated to take on parenting kids for any reason. The rest of the vitriol in this post was pretty unnecessary. That said, regardless of how you feel about your sister, she is a mother who's passing on and is trying to deal with all that entails. 
and also making sure her kids will be cared for. I don't think that has anything to do with guilt and everything to do with doing what any mother would do in this situation. Not the jerk. You didn't sign up to take on her kids. My husband and I are child free, but we have godchildren that would be entrusted to us if anything happened to their parents. We chose that, but if we hadn't, there is no way we would just agree to it. Just because your family doesn't mean you're obligated to do anything for anyone. If you do something, it should be because you chose to. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his sister? Please let us know. My husband stole $6,000 from my account to spend on golf clubs. I'm a nurse and have been working more hours for the past six months to be able to save money to fix the ceiling in our house. I've saved up $8,000 in my account and since my husband hasn't worked since 2020, I'm trying to balance rent and utility payments. My husband is a golf enthusiast and so are his friends. Only difference is that all of his friends are well off and they can afford expensive golfing gear and trips. They mentioned wanting to go on a golfing trip next week and invited my husband, but he initially refused. Though he really wanted to go, but complained about how his friends bought fancy new golfing gear while all he has is his old gear. He asked if I could lend him $6,000 so he could buy a set of golfing clubs, but I refused because $6,000 for a set of clubs is crazy expensive, especially for someone who doesn't work. He got upset and accused me of holding his employment over his head when he couldn't help it. Anyway, I thought we were over this argument, but I had discovered that he had pulled the $6,000 out of my account and purchased the set behind my back. I went home and exploded on him. He swore he'd return the money once he gets home from the trip, but I told him he had no right to take the money and spend it on a set of golf clubs while the ceiling needs fixing. He said the ceiling doesn't require $6,000 either, but the kid's room was affected too. I demanded that he return the set or pay me the $6,000 right then and there. He told me I was being unfair to him and that he's feeling stuck because his friends can afford to buy whatever while he's being yelled at for wanting something for himself for once. I told him to get a job and buy himself whatever. He tried to tell me he'll pay me when he finds a job, which is after he gets back from his trip, but I refused. He kept begging me to let him just go on the trip and we'll figure it out later on, but I said no. If it wasn't for something as important as the ceiling, I would have maybe waited, but he's saying that I'm controlling of his life. Edit. First of all, I'm getting too many comments. I'm too overwhelmed to respond. People that are suggesting I return the clubs myself, I can't because he never brought them to the house. I've never seen them and I don't know where he's hiding them. I suspect his brother's house, but I'm on really bad terms with him and can't go to his house. So the argument now is just him pushing to get me to stay quiet until he gets back from the trip, but I'm putting my foot down and refusing. Not the jerk. This is a massive red flag. He stole from you. $6,000 is a lot of money, and if he's not working, how on earth is he going to pay you back? The fact that you're working your butt off to repair the ceiling, which is a major need, and he thinks that golf clubs are far more urgent than home repairs really shows how childish he is. By her picking up even more shifts at work, probably, I can't get over how much of a jerk this guy is. He stole the $6,000 from OP's account. Yep, if it's not a joint account, then OP needs to report this to the bank and police, kick the deadbeat out, and let him face the consequences. She needs to set up a new account for herself at a different bank. Then she needs to refuse to pay for his greens fees and pretty much all recreational activities out of her paycheck. By the way, how's he paying for his golf trip? He's going to be complaining about her the whole time he's away. Finally, she needs to talk to a trusted counselor, friend, minister, or colleague and inquire if they think divorce is a reasonable course of action. Not the jerk. Please get yourself a divorce attorney ASAP. Your husband hasn't worked in two years and thinks $6,000 golf clubs are a reasonable purchase? That alone makes me deeply question his judgment. But the fact that he then stole your money to buy them is beyond the pale. This man is a selfish, unemployed, when literally everyone is hiring, thief, and you clearly can't trust him or his judgment. Lawyer up and get this jerk out of your life. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. Tell homeboy he might want to try another sport. Golf probably is not the best idea for a broke deadbeat. I do not need you staying here with me answering phone calls or processing customers for the rest of the shift. Context. 
I used to work at a major supermarket in the online grocery department. This happened when I was about 7 months in this position and about this time the next stage of lockdown had arrived, which meant that everyone in the community was scared of getting sick and didn't want to actually walk into the grocery store to shop. Thus, all of these folks placed online orders for either pickup or delivery. Due to this exceptional demand, our bosses decided to have 20 order slots available to customers per hour for pickup. I worked in the pickup team and the delivery team was outsourced to a third party company. Anyways, we have a couple of new colleagues join us and one of them in particular is of a very young age, around three years younger, who also happens to be a micromanager and essentially a jerk to work with. We'll call him Andy. Andy loves to go on his phone all the time. Mind you, I'm only post-secondary now and this happened in early 2021. In our team, we have a couple roles which are assigned to staff on a daily basis. Sometimes the roles change, but generally they stay the same. Per our specific store policy, there are supposed to be two persons in the home area of the team at all times answering customer calls and gathering all the necessary bins for a person's order. Note that role is given to generally more tenured persons unless they request otherwise and requires additional training from the department manager. One person is responsible for taking out the groceries to the customer's vehicle and the rest of the staff are usually assigned to collect the individual items off the store shelves per customer's order. Story One day, I come into work and I'm working a full shift, 8 hours. It happens that I'm working with newer staff only and Andy is also working. There is no role assignment sheet out on that day so no specific roles were assigned. I decide, since I'm more tenured and have had the necessary training, that I would stay in the home area of the team. Andy comes up to me and says that the manager had assigned him to stay for his shift, and he requested for me to help collect items off the shelves for the rest of the shift. Note here, it's difficult to be using your phone while collecting customer items, so ideally you want to stay in the home base to use your phone. Me, you haven't had the training from the manager yet, and I'm more tenured. Andy. No, I have had the training. Please go and collect items. I do not need you staying here with me answering phone calls or processing customers for the rest of the shift. Me. Are you sure? All of the order slots are full for the rest of the shift. Andy. Yes, it's fine. Please go and collect items. Me. Okay. Malicious compliance. So I go and start collecting items for future customers' orders and return to base after a run, hour one to drop off the containers with items and grab new containers. You can only take so many containers in a cart at once. Andy seems to be managing fine, so I don't disturb him and go out for a second run. I come back, hour two, and Andy asks me to take over his customer phone call. At this point, customer is arguing over something trivial. But I tell him, you told me you don't need me to stay here for the entire shift, so I'm going for another run. Andy hesitantly agrees, and I continue with my third run. I come back, hour 3, and there is a queue of about 7 post-it notes, anticipated customer wait time of 35 minutes, yikes, with customer orders on it, and Andy is on the phone with a customer. Post-it notes were used when we didn't have time to print off proper order summaries. Additionally, the policy for waiting times is a maximum of 5 minutes from the time they call. He sees me and asks me to help him process orders as well as obtaining the required container so the staff responsible for taking orders out could do so in a timely manner. Once again, I tell him, You told me not to stay here and do any of the home base's tasks. I'm going for another run. I come back, hour four, and there's a long line of 23 post-it notes with customer orders on it. Anticipated customer wait time of two hours. Big yikes. And this time, he pulls on my arm as soon as I come in and asks me to help him answer phone calls and process orders. But once again, I refused, referencing what he told me. He let out a massive sigh and called the manager's extension. At this point, I went out to do another run. Halfway, hour 4.5, through my run, I'm interrupted by the manager on duty. Our team's manager had gone home for the evening. He asks me to come with him to help Andy in our area to clean up the backlog as at this point, customers were waiting well over three and a half hours. Major problem. I walk back into the home base, and the manager questions me of why I wasn't staying in the home base, taking care of phone calls and customer orders. I tell him the full truth, specifically that Andy had strictly noted that our team manager assigned him and him only to be in the home base managing these tasks, 
and Andy had sent me out to collect customer items for the rest of the shift in its entirety. Andy rebutted with the fact that he did not say this and that he had asked me to help him multiple times and I had blatantly refused. Hmm. I told both the manager and Andy that I'll be helping to clear the backlog and then going back to doing runs. And at this point, I empathized with our customers waiting for three and a half hours. At the end of my shift, we finally managed to catch up a decent amount and I did end up staying about 30 minutes overtime to reschedule the customers scheduled for later in the day to the next day's morning slots double booking the next day's slots, while Andy went home already. As a courtesy, I gave each customer that had to be rescheduled a $20 voucher. There were 44 total rescheduled customers. Just as I clocked out, I bumped into the manager, and he tells, slash rants to me, what a crap show today was. I tell him, you may want to look at the CCTV of our home base. Have a good rest of your night. Fallout. It so happened that I was taking two weeks of leave that day, and after the leave, when I went back, I noticed every shift that Andy was doing runs and never staying in the home base. Turns out, the manager on duty looked at the CCTV that very same night and heard very clearly what Andy had told me. Conferring with our team manager, they canceled his administrator permissions on the order processing computer, which he had begged our team manager for over two weeks, as well as giving him a written warning. However, that didn't seem enough, since while I was away, Andy decided to do the same thing to another staff member and ended up getting a second and essentially final written warning. Plus, he made it on the frequent monitoring list of every manager. At three written warnings, your employment is immediately terminated. The days and shifts that followed after were very pleasant as there was not a single peep from Andy when he came into work. He directly started collecting customer items without asking. Edit 1. Update after I called my friend who still works there. 1. Andy still works there, still has his admin privileges revoked, and is solely collecting customer items. Printed with the assignment sheet. Not anticipated to change. Generally, role assignments are written in on the day of. 2. Former team manager was laid off in January 22 for mistreating the department, including scheduling staff outside of their availability slots, as well as multiple incidences of not following policy. 3. Our team's voucher budget increased 50% for this calendar year because of worse incidents that happened after I left the company. Am I the jerk for refusing to babysit someone who accused me of stealing? The title doesn't make much sense, and I don't know how else to word it. Okay, so basically, I used to babysit this family with deaf kids, which was perfect because I'm deaf. One day, I had to sleep over because the parents were at a meeting. Their daughter loved jewelry, so they asked me to hide the jewelry box, which I did. The next day, I rode the bus with them to school and went home because I had the day off. Later that day, my parents said that the parents said that their jewelry box was missing and I told them where I hid it. They couldn't find it and I was the first to blame because one, I had access to their house and two, I knew where it was. My parents were on my side, luckily, and defended me and now these people were blaming me for taking it. I did get dragged to court and was proven innocent. When it came to evidence, we didn't have much so we asked to see the neighbor's footage of that night, but he wouldn't let us. They did eventually get the evidence and found the guy who did it. They apologized, but I didn't want to babysit anymore. It's been a while since then, and they can't find a babysitter with any ASL knowledge and keep begging me to come back. Edit, for anyone wondering, I'm 15. Edit, hello there, this is OP's mom. I want you guys to hear me and his father's side of this. We never believed when this lady first called us and said that he stole. He is our child, and we would go to the moon and back to prove him innocent, and we might have lost the case if it wasn't for the footage we eventually got. I do not trust that lady. Our son, OP, is a smart kid, and we know whatever decision he decides to make will be the right one for him. Edit. Guys, it was the neighbor's footage, not the family I babysat. Edit again. Thank you for the advice. I don't need any more reasons why I shouldn't go back. Your advice is appreciated, but it's done its duty. As I've stated earlier, I'm never going back to that family ever again. I've been advertising my skill set all over and found a family. I apparently did well with the interview and they offered $25 an hour to start. Me and my parents talked and made the decision that, if it is the best course of action, getting a restraining order. Thank you all so much for your support and it was very much appreciated. Not the jerk. They accused you of theft. They broke trust and if you don't feel comfortable with them, don't feel guilted into going back. 
or else demand they set up a baby camera or something or put away everything that could conceivably go missing under lock. I've been wrongly accused of stealing before. It's no joke. Am I the jerk for leaving a bad review on a facility director I bullied 12 years ago? I was a bratty teenager. I treated others unfairly. I'm not proud of it. After graduating high school, I didn't have a clue on what to do, so I went to a community college and chose a program that sounded interesting. Because I'm very outgoing, I made friends pretty quick. People found me hilarious. The main reason I was so funny was I really ripped into one of the shy girls in class. Obviously, I had issues with my security at the time and have gone through therapy. During this period, though, I didn't have the right guidance. I knew to make friends, we had to find a common ground. She was just an easy target. It should be noted, I think she suffered from anxiety before the program. The more classmates and I laughed at her or snubbed her, the more anxious she became, to where the instructor told her this wasn't the career for her because she wasn't functioning to her full ability. It doesn't matter, I know, but I regret it. No one will believe me, but I did experience karma and lots of it after all of this. Now, my fiancé and I decided we wanted to adopt a pet and one of the animal rehabilitation centers were listing an adorable dog. We decided to meet her. First, we had to talk with the facility's director, which, surprise, surprise, is the girl that I bullied. We recognized each other pretty quickly. I don't know if it was the past or her being so shy, but she was very uneasy through our conversation. She seemed in a good spot overall, married, she has kids, obviously successful career, which was a relief to me. I hoped she had moved on from everything. I did admit to her I was sorry for how things were all those years ago, but she had obviously flourished beyond that. She smiled and said, yes she has. I'm relieved and believe the past is in the past. An hour later, the fiancé gets a call saying we were not approved for the next steps of possibly meeting the dog. Obviously, I was wrong in my assumption. I reviewed the facility and called her out by name because I know very well there isn't anything that makes us unfit owners. My fiancé doesn't agree with me though. In fact, he says I'm only fueling the fire and maybe if I hadn't been such a jerk, we wouldn't have been rejected. Am I the jerk? Update. Okay, do you guys not see the irony here? I found so many messages in my DMs and in the comment section calling me every name in the book and wishing bad things on me. To defend a victim of bullying, you become a bully? I show these comments to my fiancé, and no, he doesn't agree with any of the judgments. After cooling down, he realized it was petty and childish of her. She is the owner of the facility. All adoptions are decided by her. When I mentioned her flourishing, it was because I was surprised, but very happy she had moved on from something that happened 12 years ago. It was great to see. No, I wasn't making it by myself. Also, when we talked, she mentioned how she would have hated being in that kind of career that program was designed for. Getting booted out made her realize her true passion was for animals. I'm not trying to defend my actions. I'm saying I didn't completely ruin her career path like some suggest. Wait, so you bullied her again? Clearly, you haven't grown up at all. Massive, you're the jerk. What an entitled jerk. Unfortunately for you, being a horrible bully does in fact make you an unworthy owner. That's her prerogative to decide. If you don't like it, too bad. It's 100% your fault. She was a bratty teenager and now she's a bratty adult. You're the jerk. You effectively said to this woman, sorry I was a horrible human, but it looks like you've done fine anyway. Dismiss the harm you did in the same breath as apologizing for it and expected her to place another living being in your care? Ha, <laughs> no. And then you publicly blame her for what sounds to me like a perfectly reasonable professional judgment. Yikes. If the facility manager didn't know you, she might still not have moved you forward towards adopting a dog. Knowing you as she does, it was her duty to halt the process. You sound like you need to work on you a lot more before you try to take responsibility for a dependent soul. OP doesn't even admit to apologizing for being a horrible human being just said she apologized for how things were. You haven't changed, and you haven't learned a thing. Do you honestly think just saying, hey, sorry about all that, but looks like you're doing okay, so no harm, no foul, right? Fix the damage you caused? Don't you understand the director turned you down because she absolutely knows you have the potential for cruelty, malice, and selfishness? 
You have it in you to treat a person like they are an object for your amusement, which makes it entirely possible you'd mistreat a helpless animal even more. She made the right call. Your fiancé was right too. You're the jerk. Don't like The Simpsons? No coffee for you. This story happened 30 years ago. As many of you know, The Simpsons is the longest running scripted show. Edit on primetime television. In the late 80s and early 90s, it was controversial, with many high-profile people denouncing it for what they deemed to be inappropriate characters. Someone was always in a rage about the latest episode and the things Bart or Homer said or did. Well, at the time, my sister was married to a guy named Bob, who was old before his time. He was also deeply conservative, personally, socially, fiscally, and politically opinionated, autocratic, and overbearing. One of those has to be the smartest guy in the room types. At a family gathering at my parents' house, we were sitting around after dinner and I recounted a funny line from the show. Bob grew angry and started fulminating about the show. That show is so darn stupid. That Homer guy screaming and carrying on all the time. It drives me nuts. If I had my way, it wouldn't be on TV. I asked him if he ever even watched it. No, I wouldn't waste my time. It's a stupid cartoon that shouldn't be on the air. I thought about what he said for a moment. Oh, because you don't like it, I shouldn't be allowed to watch it? Darn right. If I had my way, it wouldn't even be allowed on TV. Really? That makes sense to you? Now, if there was anything Bob hated more than The Simpsons, it was anyone questioning or challenging him. If he said it, it was right. So, of course, he doubled down. Yes, it makes perfect sense. I'm not the only one who says it. If I was in charge, that show wouldn't be on the air. He was getting angrier and red-faced at being forced to defend his position. Okay, I thought, if that's the way you think it should be. I got up and grabbed his cup of coffee from him, went to the sink, and dumped it. What the heck did you do that for? He yelled. I don't like coffee, I said. I'm not the section leader? Then why should I teach? When I was a high school junior, I was second chair for the second violins and orchestra. My stand partner, the section leader, was this sophomore who I'll call Ben. Ben was an amazing violinist and he knew it. He would frequently tell me that I was the only violinist in the section that he respected, which rubbed me the wrong way because he was actively insulting my friends. When we did sectionals, Ben would take advantage of our director being in a separate room to tear down everyone's confidence and basically just be a huge jerk about everything. During the second trimester, he wasn't able to take orchestra, and I became the section leader. This may be self-congratulatory, but every person in the section came to me privately and told me that they much preferred me over Ben because I actually respected them. I made a point to use constructive criticism over straight criticism, and I admitted that I don't have a lot of free time to practice, so I understood that they couldn't dedicate their lives to high school orchestra. Third trimester, Ben came back. I was once again second chair, and he was first. He would make the weirdest comments like, Hey girl, you miss me? To which I would just roll my eyes and keep practicing. Despite these comments, he seemed to have mellowed out. Unfortunately, he didn't. First sectional, he went right back to yelling and degrading the second violins. I would often tell him to stop, and I would bring up how much progress we had made while he was gone. After I had mediated, he quieted down. At least until I tried to explain some notation in the sheet music, he started yelling at me and kept repeating, I'm the section leader. The only person that knows how things work is me. Cue malicious compliance. I started slacking off during sectionals. I would play with the full orchestra, and I did individual practice. But when we were separated, I completely ignored what was going on. Ben was obviously frustrated, but he couldn't really do anything until one day he got to the notation that I was trying to explain before. He had no idea what he was talking about, and so he asked me to explain it. My response? Sorry, Ben, but you're the section leader. I obviously don't know how to do anything. Ben stormed out and didn't show up to class again. I found out two weeks later that he had quit orchestra. I felt kind of bad about it, but that guilt went away quickly when I could hear the vast improvements my section made without being verbally mistreated constantly. Am I the jerk for banning my former mother-in-law from my house? My former mother-in-law is 52 years old and I am 32 years old. Back when I was 23, I married. I got my then-girlfriend pregnant 
We married soon after and she gave birth to our daughter. Two years after, my wife got extremely sick and passed soon after, leaving me with our daughter. I decided to move several states away back to my own parents as I work a lot and my parents volunteered to help me with my daughter. This went on for a while until I made a good promotion and had enough money saved up to get my own house half an hour away from my parents and since then watching my daughter during the day while I am at work is split between the nanny I hired and my parents. Before you think I am taking advantage, my parents insist on watching her. My daughter is 8 now in case you wonder and I generally work 8 to 6. My former mother-in-law decided to move to the town I live because she wants to be close to her granddaughter slash my daughter. I initially had no issue with this. After all, my wife was her only child and my daughter her only grandchild. I only started having an issue when she actually moved. Since she moved here, she was at my house pretty much all day, including when I got home after work and the weekends. She would even be there when my daughter was at school and no one was home to clean. After having multiple conversations and arguments with her where I stated I was of the opinion her behavior was inappropriate and she was crossing boundaries, she finally toned it down for a while. However, slip-ups were and are common. Last week was the last straw for me. Since the past year and a half, I have started dating again and met a woman. However, due to lockdown, we have not been able to spend much time together. With everything opening up here, I invited her over after asking my parents to watch my daughter. When we were fooling around on the couch, my ex-mother-in-law let herself in and of course without calling, knocking or asking and proceeded to lose her crap and accused me of cheating and disrespecting my deceased wife. I finally had enough. I went over, snatched my key from her, forced her out of my home and told her she is no longer welcome in my house. She really has no one else and several people including my parents have weighed in asking me to change my mind. I am not sure if I am the jerk here. Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.